All right. So uh, real quickly, I want I want to review our mitosis and meiosis, our cell cycles, because they are going to have very direct applications to what we're talking about today. You see meiosis written on the board there? Uh, there it is, as one of our topics. And so somebody please remind me of the five phases of both mitosis and the two stages of meiosis. What is phase one, Kai? Wait, is that the interface? Well, interface, interface is not part of it. So once it, once interface starts. Okay. Um, prophase. Prophase. And what happens during prophase? Um, oh, great. The nuclear envelope great. dissolves. Nope. That happens during prometaphase. Dang it. Well then. Yeah. The genes decondense. The chromosomes. The chromosomes decondense. Kyle. And the little spindles. They, they the spindles. Up. Yeah, they migrate to opposite poles, and something yeah, starts to grow out of those centrioles. The spindle, right, that spindle forms. Okay, and then which phase comes next? Yeah, Rick. Prometaphase. Prometaphase. And Carrie, what happens during prometaphase? Lydia, what happens during prometaphase? The nuclear envelope disappears, and the some of the microtubules growing in the spindle make contact with the chromosomes. And what do we call those microtubules that make contact? Kinetochore? Oh, oh. oh. I'm not looking at my notes. It's in the That's room. right. It's got to become just head. part of who you are. Rick? Okay, so what's the next stage after okay. pro-metaphase? Emma? Metaphase. metaphase. And what happens during metaphase, Carrie? The chromosomes line up. The chromosomes get to that middle pole. <laughs> and during mitosis and during meiosis 2, they are lined up single file. But during meiosis 1, the two versions of chromosome one are lined up together, side by side, holding hands, feet, and then heads. They, then they get ripped apart. Then they get ripped apart. During, next phase, anaphase. anaphase. And in anaphase, you rip components apart. In anaphase one, or in anaphase two, and in anaphase of mitosis, you are ripping what apart? Yes, the chromatids. You're, it, you're ripping and the individual chromosomes by separating the two chromatids from each other. But during anaphase one, what are you separating? The two versions oh, the two. of the same yeah. chromosome. We call those the homologous chromosomes. And then after anaphase, we have Lydia? Telophase or telophase. And what happens during telophase? The, the, yeah. The nuclear envelope, it's like it reforms, yeah. and, but it reforms not as a single nucleus, but as two separate nuclei around now the two poles of chromosomes. What else happens? Um, yeah, Kyle? Oh, chromosomes decondense. Chromosomes decondense, and what else? Decondense. Decondense. The mitotic spindle They spread out. And oh, yeah. The mitotic yeah, yeah, spindle yeah, yeah. just dissolves. I said decondense last time, didn't I? But I might mm -hmm. condense it this time. And what happens that overlaps anaphase and telophase? Carrie. Cytokinesis. Cytokinesis. The one cell becomes two. That's just beautiful. Okay, good. Review is over. <laughs> That's definitely the noise to make. Okay. So now we have we have we basically have an issue. I, I wanna I wanna I wanna put you into the mindset of a late 19th century scientist and you are studying inheritance, and you basically have two competing hypotheses uh, of, of how inheritance works, right? So this idea is, if you've got two parents, how do their traits show up in their offspring? Okay? And you've got, you've got two competing hypotheses. You have one that's called the blending Hypothesis. So this is like late 19th century, early 20th century. The blending hypothesis. 14. And I don't know what it's called, Trinity. I'm sorry. Yeah, Kyle's a perfect blending. Wow. That's perfect. Particulate hypothesis. Actually, that's not true because you'll see that in a minute. Okay, so the blending hypothesis basically said this. 
Every cell in your body, every cell in your body gives off these little bits of information called gimules. Every cell in your body gives off gimules. This is just such a cool word that concentrate in gametes. Okay? So every cell in your body gives off gimules that concentrate in the gametes. When gametes fuse, the traits blend together. And, and the idea here is it's, it's kind of like if you take a, a blue color and you take a yellow color and you mix them, you get green. And if you contributed more of those blue gimules to your gamete than your partner did yellow gimules, then it's going to be a darker green. But if the other thing is true, that there are more yellow gimules than there are blue, then it's going to be a lighter green. That's what's up. Okay? So blending hypothesis. The particulate hypothesis basically says this. Every character, and a character could be eye color, it could be hair color, it could be pigmentation in the skin, it could be the widow's peak, it could be hitchhiker's thumb. Right? Impressive. You got what? Half of that? Dude, that is 90 degrees. <laughs> this is what you would call anachronistic because hitchhiking is not really very popular nowadays. People don't really pitch up, pick up hitchhikers. But had this been 50 years ago, man, this would have gotten me a ride in any vehicle. <laughs> and it's, it's not even just the left, it's also the right, 90 degrees. You can make a full and then it's, Wait, what do you... Are they complimentary when... No, that... No, supplementary when they add up to 180 degrees. Supplementary. Like this. Like this. Like that. Like that, yeah. Okay, so every character, no matter what this character is, has discrete traits. Okay, so every character has discrete traits. Some traits mask the what, what do I want how do I want to phrase this? Some traits mask the appearance of others. So it's not, it's not, it's not a blending, although we'll find that there are some, there are some characters that are a little bit more complicated than this, but every character has discrete traits. So like if it's eye color, you've got brown, you've got blue, you've got green, right? You've got these discrete traits. And these traits, some of them will mask the appearance of others. Notice it doesn't say all traits are capable of masking, but we'll come back to this. And so the, the competing hypothesis with the blending hypothesis was not like, you know, if you take two people, they're both going to contribute gimules to their gametes. And then when their gametes fuse, it's like whoever contributed the most gimules is basically going to have the most influence on the next generation. No, it's like, no, every character has discrete traits. And those traits are going to end up in the individuals, and a lot of them are not going to be blended. And so, according to the blending hypothesis, you should basically, it should lead to the disappearance of, of, of your traits, because your next generation should be a mix of the two, but you shouldn't have either of the original. Right? And so under this blending hypothesis, it's basically impossible that if you have a particular 
you know, feature. Let's say you have somebody with a widow's peak, and they have offspring with somebody without a widow's peak. Under the blending hypothesis, you could get you should get something in between. You shouldn't have a widow's peak or no widow's peak in the offspring. You should have something in between. A widow's hill. A widow's volcano, right, where the top's been blown off. You know what I'm saying? No. We don't like volcanoes. I, I don't like volcanoes on. With, with, yeah. No. Okay, but the particulate hypothesis says, listen, it, it makes total sense why if you have a widow's peak, you can produce offspring that have a widow's peak, and you can produce offspring that don't have a widow's peak, but you're not going to produce anything with something in between because we're not blending features here. You've got discrete traits that can show up or not show up. Okay. And so ultimately, this hypothesis wins out because this one explains inheritance much better than the blending hypothesis. Also, in the area of like natural selection, when you're talking about like how does a certain feature become more abundant in a population, the blending hypothesis doesn't make any sense because you're like, how can natural selection select for something that's being blended away? It's basically disappearing, even if it's great. But you, you have offspring with somebody without it, and it basically disappears. But the particular hypothesis is like, no, it doesn't disappear. It might be masked, but it's still there. And if you can select for it, eventually it's going to become the most common trait for that character. Emma? I don't know if you just answered this, but say, for example, there's a, um, one parent with widow's peak and one without, and one child has one and the other doesn't. How does that make sense? Because if the widow's peak gene is overpowering the other gene, should both children have it? Yeah, um, it, well, it, 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 it's a little bit more complicated than that. We'll, we'll talk a lot about human genetics uh, next week. The human genetics are complicated because we, even the things that we have that are what are called monogenic inheritance, where it's basically a single gene, it's still, it, it gets a little bit, it gets a little bit complicated. So, Widow's Peak may not have been the, the best uh, example. Well, if you have, oh, so here, if you've got, let's say Widow's Peak is dominant to not Widow's Peak, okay? And so you have a Widow's Peak, but you could have one copy of the gene that says Widow's Peak and one copy that says no Widow's Peak, but the Widow Peak wins out, right? Mm -hmm. And then your mate has no Widow's Peak, meaning they have two copies that say no Widow's Peak. You could still produce offspring, then that, that would have none, because you could have given your copy that says no widow's peak, and that's all that your partner could give, and so you could form offspring that have no widow's peak. But if you gave your copy that says yes widow's peak, and then the partner gives no widow's peak, then that offspring that is going to have widow's peak. Okay? But we'll do these crosses. Okay? And so the particulate hypothesis wins out, because it explains why a trait can disappear in one generation and then reappear. The blending hypothesis doesn't explain that because it should be blended away, right? Especially two generations later, it should be so dilute that you can't see it anymore. But that's not how things work. Traits do disappear in generations, but only to reappear again. You have, have you ever heard the saying like, oh, that tends to skip a generation? Yeah. yeah. The reason for it is because it's a recessive trait and it's, and it's being explained by the particular hypothesis. It disappears only to reappear again. Like hemophilia, a bleeding disorder where you can't clot your blood properly, tends to skip a generation. Um, what's that? Uh, cystic, cystic fibrosis. Um, what are some other really good examples of recessive? Uh, albinism, common albinism. PKU, phenylketoluria, the inability to metabolize phenylalanine, which means you can't drink diet soda. Sad times. Okay? All right, any questions about this? So particulate hypothesis wins out because it explains the data better, especially having a trait disappear. Shh. Having a trait disappear and reappear is impossible under the blending hypothesis because it should be so dilute that you can't see it anymore. But under the particular hypothesis, no big deal, right? It disappears only to reappear. That's fine because it's a discrete trait that if you get two copies of that, it should reappear. Okay? Cool? Questions? Thoughts?
That was a legit question. That was a question. Good job. That wasn't like, why do penguins breathe? That was like... Why do <laughs> penguins <laughs> breathe? <laughs> <laughs> That's something Emma would ask. I just think no, she would ask that. Like if she was, I would okay. see her asking that. Yeah, that was on me too. Okay. Yeah, that was on me too. okay. All right, so we need to we need to cover a couple of terms, okay? We need to I, you, I, we need to you, you need to write these down, and these are definitions that you just you just need to know. They need to become part of who you are. Okay, a character. Character is a specific phenotypic. Condition. <coughs> Examples. <coughs> Eye color. <laughs> Hair color. <laughs> Height. Etc. It's a specific phenotypic condition. Okay? Or a specific phenotype. A gene. Now, for, for much of what we're going to do in chapters 14 and 15, you could consider these to be synonyms. So I'm going to write this. Synonyms. How do I spell this? Synonyms. Is it Y all the way around? Synonyms. 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 I was like, three Y's seems a little strange. But is this okay? Synonyms for 14 and 15. Okay? So for chapters 14 and 15, you could consider those to be synonyms. For everything else, you need this definition of a gene. Section. Of DNA transcribed into RNA. So for 14 and 15, you can consider these to be synonyms, synonyms, synonyms. But for everything else, you need this definition of a gene a section of DNA transcribed into RNA. Okay? Cool. RNA yes. polypeptides. Cool. All right. Trait. The central dogma of molecular biology. DNA exists to be transcribed into RNA and then translated into protein. Okay. Trait. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm a patient man. Okay, so a trait. Trait is a specific version of a character. Okay? It is a specific version of a character. Let's get some examples. If eye color was a character, how about blue? If hair color was a character, how about red? Red. <laughs> red, red. red. You hear what I said? Uh, and if, if height is a character, how about tall? And you're like, we've got a tall, red-headed, blue-eyed person. Like, I bet that's a great... Great human being, high quality. Oh my Robinson. Of course, I am just slightly above average height, but I would, I, 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 I guess you'd have to call me tall. And I've got red hair when I have it, right here, and blue eyes. Wow. I mean, that's just like a combination. That is, the that, that is a great recipe for making a human being. Perfect example. The last one. Allele. 
Hey, do you know that the red-headed gene is disappearing rapidly? Yes. Oh, yeah. How's that? Hey, well, it disappear? Genetic drift. Random genetic changes. Tokyo drift? Okay, shh. Genetic drift happens in Tokyo. Is it Tokyo drift? Trait and allele. You can all, uh, no, no, let's do this. These are also synonyms. Synonyms. In 14 and 15. In chapters 14 and 15, trait and alleles, you can consider them to be synonyms. But in everything else, you need this, this definition of an allele. A specific form of a gene. All right? So for 14 and 15, you can consider them to be synonyms? They're very, because if that's a specific form of a gene, and the other one's specific form I know, a gene is a synonym with character. Whoa. They're all connected. And we are just knocking things off of our to-do list. Katie. If I married someone with red hair, would our children have to have red hair? Nope. Or a G? Not necessarily. Oh, because you have two copies. Yeah, well, and hair color is complicated. So human eye color is influenced by at least 15 genes. Human hair color is influenced by more than one gene. So it's a little bit complicated. Yeah. It's a little bit complicated. There's a pretty good probability of it, but it's, it's a little complicated. Okay? No. Any questions on these definitions? So these definitions need to become part of who you are. You just, they're just, they're second nature. It's like incredibly silly. It's like, it defines who I am. <laughs> it's amazing that there are four, that it's been out for a year almost. Like if you haven't seen it by now, you, you. It's not like somebody spoiled an episode of, you know, Breaking Bad the day after. You all don't know about Breaking Bad. I, can, I, can I, know, I know about Breaking I know, Bad. I know. I know. I was, but, I mean, this is like, it's been a year. Like, you can't, you can't expect people to keep quiet. Here, let's use a better example. Like, if you recorded the Super Bowl because you were going to watch it later, and somebody, like, spoiled it for you that day, that's pretty lame. But if it's like the next day and you haven't watched it yet, I mean, you can't you can't be upset about it being spoiled. It's been a year, Emma. <laughs> there's a there's a statute of limitations on on spoiling movies, and I'd say it's it's about three months. Because once three months passes, it has time that it's come out on Netflix or on DVD. Yeah. Oh, I know. I watch it often. Okay. Any questions about this? Who I am. Okay. Uh, Goodbye. Dude, the best part of that entire movie is the battle between Jack Jack and the raccoon. Oh, that's iconic. Yeah. I mean, that is just so good. I love. I well, I don't really love raccoons, but I respect them. And. Uh, we have raccoons in our house, not in our house, like in the, we have this pillar bar, because they live up there. So my cat tries to attack them and they get in fights. But sometimes they're fights. They have babies. They disappear. I'm like, oh my god. It's gross. One time. Do they have a latrine in your backyard where they play? I don't know. Have you found it? No. If you find it, let me know and, and I'll come clean it for you because it's very, very dangerous. Oh, okay. Wait, very really? Dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, they have a they have a very common parasite um, that that can infect humans and has some very serious implications. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any questions about this? Because now we need to talk about Mendel and his specific contribution to inheritance. Oh wow, we are making great time. Is it really only eight thirty-seven? Probably. We're really killing it. Okay. So Mendel's contributions really demonstrated that without a doubt, the particulate hypothesis is the one that best explains inheritance. The problem is nobody really read Mendel's work until about 50 years after he published it. And by that time he had died. Um, and so 
Mendel's contribution to the area of genetics, uh, it, it was delayed. It was a delay, but it showed basically without a doubt that the particular hypothesis better explained inheritance than blending. And so Mendel came up with two laws. First one, called the law of segregation. Law of segregation. And now Mendel did not use these words, but I told you that for 14 and 15, you can consider them to be synonyms. He didn't even use the words characters and traits either because he wrote in German, I think. Um, is that right? I think was his name was Gregor Mendel, but I don't think he was actually German. I think he might have been Swiss. Dr. Phillips, do you know? No, he was Austrian. He was Austrian. But it, so maybe he spoke because Austrian's a language, right? Do they? I know they speak ger mostly German. Gregor Mendel, he's Austrian. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So law of segregation. Law of segregation basically says this, and again, these aren't the words that he used, but I told you for fourteen and fifteen, you could consider them to be synonyms. And the law of segregation says this: for every gene, every gene, there are two copies in organisms. These copies separate during gamete formation. That is, each gamete gets one copy. Okay? So for every gene, there are two copies in organisms. But these two copies separate during gamete formation so that each gamete gets one copy. And you're like, do we have a cell cycle process that can re that can reduce the, the 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 DNA number from two copies down to one? And we do. Yeah. What is it? Meiosis. Meiosis. So Gregor Mendel didn't know about meiosis, but meiosis explains how this works. However, his data showed this. Yeah, Rick. I was going to ask, how do you know that? Oh, I'll, I'll, what, 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 I'll show you that in a minute. we got to do his laws, and then I'll, I'll give you the observations that he made to discover these laws. Okay? First, got to do the laws, though. Any questions here? Well, how can you establish, so you can establish laws after? Yes, after he made those observations. So he's like, oh, I think this. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's how it works. The other one is called, shh. The law of independent assortment. The, shh. Yeah. Law of independent assortment. Law of independent assortment. And you're like, what's happening here? What is happening here? And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this law. Again, he did not use these words. But here's what's happening here. The separation of copies at one gene do or the separation, so does not, sorry, separation is singular, so this is the form, of the form of the verb that we need, but you all know this. Okay, the separation of copies at one gene does not influence the separation at a second gene. Oh, that makes 
Yes. Okay. The separation of copies at one gene does not influence the separation at a second gene. That is, the two genes are independent of one another and how they are inherited. Okay? And we'll see this play out. I'll show you how this works. You'll love it. It'll enrich your life in many, many wonderful ways. Okay? Any questions about these laws? And again, he did not use these words, one, because he wrote in German, and two, because we didn't really know genes and alleles and how DNA worked at this time, but now we do. And so we get what's called the neo-Darwinian synthesis, where we take Mendel's thoughts and we apply a molecular understanding to them. All right, any questions about the laws? That's it. Two laws. Law of segregation, law of independent assortment. Both of these show that without a doubt, the particulate hypothesis much more clearly explains inheritance than blending, and more accurately. Okay? Can I erase this? Okay, because I want to show you the observations that he made to come up with these laws. The observations that he made. Okay, observation number one. Observation number one. Some traits... mask other traits for the same character, for the same character. And what he did to determine this is he took pea plants and say he would take pea plants that produced green seeds and he would cross them with pea plants that produced yellow seeds, and all of the offspring of that cross would have green seeds. So that, that, that trait, green seed color, masked what had to be there. It wasn't, they weren't blending. You weren't taking green and blending it with yellow to make a lighter green. You were, you were maintaining that green, that very rich green, obvious green color. So some traits mask other traits for the same character. Observation number two. Some individuals are true breeding for their trait. So some individuals are true breeding for their trait, meaning some individuals with green seeds, you cross them with any individual and the offspring are always going to have green seeds. But what does this imply if we say some individuals are true breeding for their trait, what does it imply? Are some are not. Observation number three, some individuals are not true breeding. And now it's like, there must be something different about how that trait is being determined in those individuals. Some individuals are true breeding. Some individuals are not. Meaning, phenotypically, they look the same, but there must be something different in their programming. Observation number four. Recessive traits. And so these are the traits that get masked. Recessive traits, I'll put this in parentheses, the masked ones. Like the Incredibles. Sorry for ruining that for you. <laughs> they they wear masks in yeah, the second that. film. Yeah. And that's how they know like if they're super or not. Because like one time they have a mask on. Like, <gasps> yeah. So recessive traits disappear <laughs> with 
when crossed with true breeding. Why did I hyphenate this one and not any others? That's fine. I'm going to maintain that. Uh, Cross with true breeding dominant individuals, but reappear in later generations. And now you're like, okay, this is getting really strange. We take these individuals with the recessive trait, we cross them with individuals with the dominant trait that are true breeding, that always produce offspring with the dominant trait, those recessive traits disappear. But they come back in later generations, showing that they are blending out, and they're being maintained in individuals with the dominant phenotype. So he looked at this and said, okay, there must be some individuals that have the dominant phenotype, and the reason why they are not true breeding is because they have a copy of that recessive trait. One of their versions of that gene is the recessive trait, but, and one of them is the dominant. And so it must have one that can mask the other, but they still have that recessive trait. And so it can reappear in later generations if you form offspring that have two copies of that recessive trait. And then a fifth observation, because you're like, okay, maybe I understand how this could explain how he came up with the law of segregation. But how does the law of independent assortment factor in? And so later observations that he made were that this happening at one gene or for one character didn't influence what happened with a second character. That his predicted ratios held out. Even when you started to consider more than one character. But we'll, we'll see this, because we, we need to do some crosses. So there's no more observations? <laughs> no more observations, no more laws. No more observations, no more laws. I feel like I don't give you guys enough notes in a day. Because like we have hour-long classes, when, I, when we record, the, it ends up being like 70, 75 minutes, our recordings. And then I feel like you only get like maybe two pages of notes. How many pages do you want us to get? I don't know, 15? What? 35? <laughs> How fast can you write? Not that fast. Not that fast. You know, uh, do you all know who Charles Spurgeon is? Yeah. So Charles Spurgeon is one of the most famous what? pastors of all time. He pastored the uh, Metropolitan Tabernacle Church in London for, like, not 50 years, because he died at 57, so that would be impossible. He started pastoring, I think, when he was 19, and then died at 57. So what is that? That's 38 years? Is that right? Somebody check my math. Okay, so for a long time. But anyways, Charles Spurgeon uh, was a alive at a time where, ba I think he died in, man, Let's see, in the, night, in the 1860s, he was in his late 20s. And if he died in his late 50s, he died in the 1890s. Okay? But there was somebody that would listen to every sermon that he gave and would write it out, and then they would publish it. And I was like, man, that person must have wrote fast. And this was at a time where people would preach for hours. Like Charles Spurgeon would get up and he would preach for two and a half hours, nonstop. And this, this guy would just write it down word for word, and then they published him and sent him all over the world. And then people here would burn Charles Spurgeon's sermons because he spoke out against uh, slavery, and so people would have, like, Charles Spurgeon book-burning fests. But anyways, <laughs> that's another story for another time, okay? So, any questions? Well, it's also British history. He was British, but the Brits came to their senses before the Americans. I mean, they, they are kind of connected. You're right about that. Okay? Although by the time of the Revolutionary War, there were a lot of other European people that had come here, and they weren't all from British Like France. Descent. What I'm France. on today. France? Really? There were a lot of French uh, people here at the time of the Revolutionary War. Absolutely. Okay. No questions, thoughts, concerns? <laughs> all right. That's like integrity, whatever.
So here's what we're going to do right now. We've, we've, we've got a good foundation. We've got a good foundation, so we're going to take ourselves a three-minute break. It's cold? No, it's set at, it's, the heat's on, it's set at 70. Well, I got like a lot of layers going on here. Okay. All right. So here's these these crosses. These are what Mendel did to make these observations and then to be able to state his laws. Okay. So first, we are going to cross a true breeding female with a true breeding male for the recessive character. The only way to be true breeding as a female is to have two copies of the dominant trait, right? Because Mendel, we, we made all these observations that some individuals are true breeding, some individuals are not. And, and I told you the reason they're not true breeding is because they have a copy of the recessive trait that reappears, okay? So we've got a female here and we're gonna say she is capital G, capital G. G G, but now I'm starting to think that maybe the yellow seed color is dominant to the. Anyways, it, it doesn't really matter. It's irrelevant for the exact thing of what happens in people. Okay, so this this female is G. The problem with saying she's G G is the male is also G G, but he's got two copies of the recessive G -G. character. I don't like that. She's capital G, capital G, and the male is lowercase G, lowercase G. Okay, so according to the law of segregation, we said that for every gene, you've got two copies of that gene. Look at this. This is the G gene, and how many copies does the female have? She's got two. The male's got this G gene, and how many copies does he have? Also two. And according to the law of segregation, only one of these copies makes it into the gamete. Okay, so if we're going to cross these individuals, we need to figure out what kind of gametes can they make. Female gamete. All of her gametes are going to bear the dominant allele. That's the only allele she can make. Yes? It's the only allele she has. It's the only allele she can give to her gametes. So every single gamete she makes is going to have capital G. Yes? It's actually not being truant leaving your seat in the classroom. It is being truant to be outside of the class without permission. So that was so fun. Oh man, I, in some ways I miss those days. Calls me, calls me. Look at our campus deputy. Well, and then also, like there's, the, the kids, the, the, the bad kids had big mouths, right? Because they wanted everybody to know how cool they were. And so one time I overheard something that there's no, I had no business knowing. And then the campus deputy heard about it during lunch that day. Oh man! Oh, that was that was real good. That was real. Are you just a deputy, just like boys? Yeah. Well, my dad worked. My dad worked for the sheriff's department for until I was until I was 25, and he retired. So I knew the campus deputy. I had known him my entire life. Like he had worked with my dad for my entire life, so I knew him well. And and like we. We hung, like, our families hung out together. Oh, so you were born. Yeah, yeah, I knew him really well. Like, I had his cell phone number. His daughter was in my class. Like, at Vasquez. No. No, she wasn't in that class that tried to stage. She wasn't in the class that tried to stage too. But it's funny, because you get, like, that mob mentality. Like, you know, they're like, hey, we're all going to do this. And then it was five of them that actually did it. And the other 33 chickened out and stayed in class. But those, f those five... I mean, that was just... What just was they get arrested? What's that? <laughs> they get a truancy ticket and spend a little bit of time like their parents have to go pick them up from the sheriff's station, you know? Or somebody has to go pick them up, you know? All right, so now when we do a cross of these individuals, we can do a very simple Punnett square because our female can only make one type of gamete, our male can only make one type of gamete, so when we cross them, all we have to do is this. We've got a very simple Punnett square here. There's no sense in doing a more complicated Punnett square because really there's only one type of cross and that's one that's gonna generate us an offspring where 100% of the offspring has this programming. One capital G, one lowercase g. But we know, according to observations that Mendel made, 
that some traits mask the effects of the other trait, right? So 100% of these offspring are going to have the green seed cover, 100%. But they're no longer true breeders because now that they've got one copy of the recessive. But you see here, this was an observation Mendel made that an individual with the recessive trait, when crossed with a true breeding dominant individual, that recessive trait disappears. But they didn't blend. You didn't get something in between the two. You got the dominant trait, none of the recessive trait, but look what happens. This right here is called F1. The F1 generation, this right here is called the P generation. What do you think P stands for? Parents. Parents. And then F1 stands for offspring generation one or familial. But offspring. But now, if we take... We take one of these female offspring that what, what, is, what, is, what is her programming now? What are her two copies of that gene? G, little Capital G, little g. And we take a male from this generation and what are his two copies of that gene? Big G, Big g little g. Now if we are going to go and cross these two individuals, we do need to actually account for different types of gametes. Because this female can now make two types of gametes, yes? yes? She can make gametes that have the dominant trait, and she can make gametes that have the recessive trait. And, and what are our break, what's our breakdown? 50-50. Right? True or false, that is the same gamete phenomenon for the male. True. Male can also make two different types of gametes, capital G and lowercase g, and they're also going to be 50-50. And so now when we do this cross, we have to account for both options. And now we have to do the more familial, familial, familiar Punnett square that you've seen, because you probably haven't seen many Punnett squares with a single box. You've seen Punnett squares with four boxes, yes? yes? And we put the female's gametes on top. She can make two types of gametes, capital G and lowercase g. We put the male's gametes on the side, capital G and lowercase g. And we execute our cross. We execute our cross. So if, if, if a sperm with a capital G fertilizes an ovum with a capital G, what do you get? What two copies of those genes do you get? You get big G, big G. If a sperm with a capital G fertilizes an ovum with a lowercase g, what do you get? Big G, little g. If a sperm with a lowercase g fertilizes an ovum with a capital G, what do you get? Big G, little g. And if a sperm with a little g fertilizes an ovum with a little g, what do you get? Little g, little g. And so now, look at this. One out of every four of our offspring are going to have that recessive trait. It came back. Not in F1. In F1 it disappeared. But in F2, it came back. Okay? And you see this? So what, what phenotype is this individual going to have? Green seeds, yes? Green seeds. What about this individual? Green seeds. Green seeds, because if this individual had green seeds, this one is too. And what about this one? Green seeds. Green seeds. So 75% of the offspring are going to have green seeds and 25% are going to have yellow seeds. Well, and now I'm starting to think that yellow is actually dominant to green. So it might be, you know, the reverse of this. But really, it's, it doesn't matter because the principles still work out. Yeah. So does that mean, like, each offspring has a 75% chance to be green? Yes. Not, okay. But, yeah, well, yes. Because but then once they have their programming, if they're programmed this way, they have 100% assurity they're going to have green seeds. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm just yes. saying, like... If you had, like, say, 100 offspring, it won't work out. 
Yeah, so let's do something that's that's more intriguing. Katie, that's you have awesome. a... Okay, so let's do something that's more intriguing because you're like, Dr. Engel, these are pea plants. Like, what do I care if it's a green seed or it's a yellow seed? I'm going to eat it, right? I'm going to cook it up because I love me some peas, and I'm just going to eat it. I don't care what color it is. But let's say it's something like a poodle, like that poodle hair texture, right? Where they've got that long human-like hair that's curly and they don't really shed. And so you take an, uh, a female that's true breeding for that poodle character, and you take a male that's like, I don't know, what's the cutest, the cutest poodle mix that we have? Do you have a poodle mix? Me? Yeah. I do. What's, what's your poodle mix with? Multi-poo terrier. Oh, multi-poo terrier. Yeah. So yours is, oh wow, so what kind of a terrier? I don't know. Yeah. My brother just got a multi-poo border collie mix. Aww. And she looks like Chewbacca. I'll show you. I'll show you her in a minute. I mean, she looks like straight Chewbacca. I put them side by side in a picture that I sent to my brother yesterday. The only difference is she doesn't have a black nose like Chewbacca does. But other than that, I mean, it's it's like this like spitting image. She's a Wookie for sure. Okay. Um, and so let's say we do this. We do this cross. So in your F one, one hundred percent of your individuals are going to have that poodle characteristic. And then in your F two, if you cross. My dog, my dog is a poodle mixed with, what is he, a Springer Spaniel. So my dog's a, a poodle Springer Spaniel mix. And if we were to cross two poodle Springer Spaniel mixes, you can get offspring that are all Springer Spaniel, that have none of that poodle characteristic. I can't. I can't even say it one time fast. I, I'm not even... I, I'm not even remotely interested in trying to demonstrate my enunciation capabilities. I can barely enunciate when I'm speaking slowly and clearly. Okay. And so if you really, really want to have a dog that emphasizes that poodle characteristic, you don't do an F2. You don't cross two poodle mixes. What do you do? You cross a poodle mix with what? Another poodle. Whoa. Right? And so now you can really start to emphasize that. And you wouldn't call that F2 because F2 is a cross of two individuals from F1. You would call it, listen to this, an F1B. Oh. Oh. -ho -ho. Okay? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So we call this kind of a cross right here. These individuals are heterozygous, okay? They're not homozygous dominant. That's this individual, homozygous dominant. This is homozygous recessive. You remember these terms from, from honors bio? This is heterozygous individual, or we can call this a monohybrid individual. Monohybrid. Because they are a hybrid. They're a hybrid of two true breeding forms and at a single gene, monohybrid. And so we call this cross of F1 individuals, what do you think we call it? What do you think we call it? We call it a monohybrid cross because you crossed two monohybrid individuals. And what are our phenotypic ratios in a monohybrid cross? Yeah, which is three to one. Three to one. Or 75% dominant to 25% recessive. Okay. Shh. Do you see that? That our ratios in a monohybrid cross are three to one. Three offspring to. Are dominant have the dominant phenotype for every one offspring with the recessive trait. But that recessive trait came back. It wasn't blended away. It came back. It skipped a generation. Like common albinism and PKU, cystic fibrosis, skipped a generation. Okay. All right. Trinity. So this whole thing is called what? This whole thing... I mean, it's a, it's not called anything as an entire piece. This right here, this what we did here is called a monohybrid cross. What we did here was a cross of two true breeding individuals. It's not really called anything special. But this type of a cross is what Mendel did to demonstrate the law of segregation. Basically to demonstrate that every individual has two copies of a particular gene. And... It, each gamete only gets one of those copies. And he determined all of that by just carrying out these crosses. Cool? And nobody had thought to ever do this. How? How did nobody ever yeah, think to do this? Well, it's like 
Now, he tried to repeat these with a number of other systems. He tried to do it with honeybees and couldn't replicate his results. He tried to do it with other plants. And it was just like the pea plants were the perfect thing because all of these characters had to, happened to be influenced by a single gene. But with honeybees, it's like it's multiple genes influencing a character. It gets really super complicated. Like if you tried to illustrate this with humans, like one, it would be ethically delicate, right? Because like you'd have to force pairings. And then like humans have really small number of offsprings, right? The average litter size for a human is like 1.05. Nobody had any problem saying the average litter size. I, I said that, and I, I was expecting like litter somebody. Size? You guys, you guys didn't even respond. Well, I was you're just like, kind of like, you like, that's, that's kind of weird. I but anyways, it was like a fancy way that you would say because you're biological. Okay. Any questions about this cross, Emma? It's not about that exactly. Um, can you make a dog that has like parts of every single oh. dog in the region? Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean that. You mean like you want to design it in a lab? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, or you can just let dogs mate randomly and basically you'd get back to like a, a very wolf-like dog. Dang it. How many for you? Come here, Okay. That's definitely not. That was probably like... That was All right. Bottom and things so I want... <laughs> I'm going to present you with a dilemma, and I want you to spend a little bit of time with those around you trying to come up with a solution to this hey dilemma. Okay? You ready? We're ready. Okay, so here's your dilemma. You have an individual that has the dominant trait expressed, but you don't know whether they're true breeding or whether they're heterozygous individuals, right? Because either way, they're going to have that dominant phenotype expressed, right? Right? Yes. yes. Okay? Yes. And so what I want you to do is come up with a way in which you can determine what their genotype is, what their programming is, when all you can see is their phenotype, what's being expressed. <laughs> no, if you can't actually sequence their genes. Like you've got to you've got to do it some other way. I mean now, yeah, you I mean you could just submit Yeah, I mean, you could just submit their uh, DNA sample. Four Okay. All right, work with those around you. See if you can come up with a solution for me. That's a long process. Yeah. Really? Then you can sort the process. But also, it's not foolproof. Because then we just have to do the same thing for the next generation. We have an endless cycle of creating. Also, incest will just happen. And then that mutation is going to happen. Yes. Okay. What do we do? What do we do, Katie? So you pair it with a homo wait yeah homozygous individual. What homozygous for what? Oh, uh, dominant. Okay. So we'll cross. So here's our dilemma. We've got a female, and she's got the dominant phenotype, but we don't know if she's got two copies of that dominant gene or if she only has one copy of the dominant gene. Okay, and so we'll, we'll, we'll cross. So you want to cross her then with a male that is this. No. No, recessive. Oh, okay. So we'll cross her with a male that is recessive. Okay. So now if this is the case, she can only make one type of gamete, and it's going to be the capital G. Yes? If this is the case, she can make two types of gametes. Right? Just like our monohybrid, she's a monohybrid. That's right. Okay? And then, so this male can only make one type of gamete. So if this is the case here, we would get this cross. Right? That we've already seen. Okay? And so 100% of the individuals would have what phenotype? The girls. The dominant, right? That, that capital G. Because you only need one of the capitals to mask the lowercase. But if this is the case, yeah, 
Female can make gametes with a capital G or a lowercase g. Male can only make gametes with a lowercase g. And so your offspring should be 50% should have this characteristic and should have the dominant feature. And 50% should be this and have the recessive trait. And you know what this is called? What is this called? This is called a test cross. Test cross. Test cross. That one cross. That's awesome. Okay. You like Lydia's? <laughs> one conversation, please. Oh my gosh, no. No, I would much rather go with uh, Mr. Lee's strategy and get a fake phone. I feel like he doesn't do that. I've never seen I've only seen him do it once. I've only seen him do it once. Hello? Hey, Rick. Yeah. Can you stop talking, please? Why would I? Hey, Rick, something special is happening here and you're missing it. Yeah. It's probably stupid, but what makes something dominant? That's not stupid. Yeah, it's not a stupid question at all. So, um, it depends. It depends. It depends on, on where the gene, what the gene codes for. If the gene codes for an enzyme, what makes it dominant is having the proper form of the enzyme. So the recessive trait would be a modified version of that enzyme. Okay? If the gene is a structural protein, like in connective tissues or things like that, the dominant condition is usually dominant because you're making a mutant form of the protein that messes everything up. Just messes everything up. So it depends on what what the gene actually codes for. It, that's it, that's actually a really excellent question, but it it, it it varies. Sorry that there's not a there's not a simple answer to it. Most of the time, it's it's the first condition that you've got it. You've got the gene codes for an enzyme, and so the dominant condition is a normal version of that enzyme that can carry out facilitate whatever that reaction is. And the recessive is a malformed version of that protein. Okay. All right, no questions here? All right. All right. All right. Let's step this up. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah, 20 more minutes. 20 more minutes and then I'm on. Wow. And isn't that sad when you're like, man, we only have 20 minutes left? I mean, yeah, because this is my favorite class to be in. Yeah, Out of all the classes it. that I have, I'd, Honestly, I would, class. if I just pick a book class... You know, how cool would it be Actually, yeah. if instead of, like, a, a block schedule, you just had a class for the entire day? Hey, easy. We're not talking about any other yeah, teachers in any class. way <laughs> other than what is positive and upbuilding. Just sit there, there for two hours. You would leave. You would be Okay, so now let's step this up a little bit. Look at this. Look at this. Look at everyone. Look, everyone. Look. There's something incredible happening. Now there are two genes. Exactly. We've got the G. We've got the G gene and we've got the H gene. And we've got the G gene, and we've got the H gene. True or false? Both of these individuals are true breeding for both genes. That's true, because they only have one copy of that gene. I mean, they've got two copies of the gene, but the two copies are the same allele, Trinity. Wow. so wonderful. Do kids watch Veggie Tales? Uh, not really. They've seen it a couple of times. No, They've seen it a couple of times. Well, my, my wife watched a lot of Veggie Tales growing not up, that, but I didn't. Veggie Tales is worth that. I never watched it. I mean, it's pretty good. I I watched, but, okay. Shh. Look at this. Shh. Shh. Okay. Here's the beauty of this. We have two genes, but this female can still only make one gamete type. Oh my god. Every gamete she makes is going to be capital G, capital H. That's the only option. So we've added a second gene, but she can only she can still only make one gamete type. That's gnarly. That is gnarly. 
And look at the mail. Totally too. He can only make one too. He can only make one type of gamete. Whoa. That's remarkable. And so when we cross these individuals, this is our P generation. When we cross these individuals to get F1, we still only have one box. Females characteristics Wait, on the what? top. We don't have 16. Males boxes. characteristics on the bottom. Oh, the 16 will come. Don't That's you worry. Really That's bad. when we do a oh cross gosh. of two individuals from F1. This is about to get real crazy real fast. Real fast. Also, we did, yeah, a, totally we did a project in bio freshman year. How many boxes did we have? It was so, it was like 64, right? I think so. Yeah. I can't go the phone right now. Okay. I can't pick it. Yeah, they're, they're, they're Okay. No, so, shh. Yeah. When we cross these individuals, we get this. 100% of the offspring from this cross have one capital G, one lowercase g, one capital H, and one lowercase h. And so now these individuals are heterozygous for both genes, or what else could we call them? Did you just say it? They are not monohybrid, they are dihybrid. Di no, these are dihybrid individuals. You didn't say that? No, I said that's a lot more fun. Oh, I thought you said dihybrid. Yeah, I could have sworn that's what I heard, but you didn't answer my call. No, I didn't. Okay, so now, if we're going to cross two individuals from F1 to generate our F2 generation, what are we going to call that cross? A dihybrid cross, because we're crossing two dihybrid individuals. It'd only be a test cross if we don't know if we don't know whether they were capital G, lowercase g, or capital G, capital G, right? We, we, we don't know what their two versions of the gene is. Okay, so now we're going to cross these individuals. We've got a female that is capital G, lowercase g, capital H, lowercase h. We've got a male that is capital G, lowercase g, capital H, lowercase h. So they're the same? Okay. They have the same programming, the same yeah. genotype, if you will. Does that mean that's a phenotype? Uh, yes, absolutely. Unless we've got something, you see this right here? Can you read that? Beyond Mendel? Beyond Mendel. Wow. But we're not going to get to there. We're going to we're gonna have to do that on Monday. I didn't know it was going to take us this long to get through 14. Sorry about it. I thought we were moving that fast, basically. We were. Well, I think the problem is there's some people that didn't answer my call. And it just really that? slowed everything up. Okay, so now, listen, how many different gametes can this female make? If they assort independently, she can make four different types of gametes. But see, this is, it's like, okay, well, Mendel's law of independent assortment told us that what happens as these separate does not influence what happens as these separate, right? And if the law of independent assortment is true that she should be able to make four different types of gametes. She should be able to make gametes that are capital G, capital H. She should be able to make gametes that are capital G, lowercase h. She should be able to make gametes that are lowercase g, capital H. And she should be able to make gametes that are lowercase g, lowercase h. If the law of independent assortment is true. If the law of independent assortment is not true, then she'd only be able to make two types of gametes, and we'll get there on Monday. We're not going to get there today, but we'll get there on Monday. So, and these should all be 25%, 25%, 25%, 25%. Okay, what about the male? Same four gamete options. Mm-hmm. Capital G, capital H, capital G, lowercase h, lowercase g, capital H, lowercase g, lowercase h. So now when we do a cross of these two individuals, we have to account for all four of those gamete types. So in our F2, we're going to have a big old Punnett square. And this big old Punnett square is going to have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Four. Because the female could have given this gamete, she could have given this gamete, she could have given this gamete, or she could have given this gamete. Yes? The male could have given this gamete, could have given this gamete, 
could have given this gamete, or he could have given this gamete. Each, each, each individual can make four different types of gametes. Four different types of gametes that can combine with four different types of gametes makes four times four is 16, gives us 16 different options. Now, not all of the options are going to be unique. This one's going to be GGHH, all caps. This one's going to be all caps for G and one cap for H. This one's going to be all caps for H and one caps for G. And this one's going to be... That give us back to our mono hybrid or our dihybrid condition. Check this out. If we cross these two gametes, we're going to get capital G, capital G, capital H, lowercase h. Look at this. Look at this. These are the same. These are the same, but we got to the same condition so how many, different ways. So how many possibilities do we actually have? Of genotypes? Yeah. We'll see. Well, phenotypes, actually. Well, of phenotypes, you only have four different phenotypes. Oh, so then the genotype, because, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, never mind. All right, and then we'll do this cross, and we've got capital, capital, lowercase, <laughs> lowercase, and we didn't have that option in our first row. That's something new. That's different. That's different. <laughs> And this one is like this, which we had here. Got to the same thing, but a different way of getting to the same thing. You see that? We've got a dihybrid individual. And then this is capital G, lowercase g, lowercase h, lowercase h. That's new. We haven't seen that before. She's different. And then here we've got capital G, lowercase g, capital H, capital H. Oh, we've seen this before. This one's up here. See this one, let's put a little asterisk there and put it up here. We've seen that before. That's, that's, that's nice. nothing new. <laughs> and then here we've got capital G, lowercase g, capital H, lowercase h. Oh, we've seen this before. We saw that. Where was where's that other one? Where where is it? Oh, it's right here. It's right there. It's right it's right there. We've got now like a three in a row. We just won a sweet game of tic-tac-toe. <laughs> what call it? Ultimate tic-tac-toe. Oh, really? Lowercase g, lowercase g, capital H, capital H. Oh, look at this. We got another new one. Newbie. Newbie in, a, in the third row. <gasps> and then this is lowercase g, lowercase g, capital H, lowercase h. That one's new, too. We ain't seen it before. And then here is capital G, lowercase g, capital H, lowercase h. Look at that! All the way across! All the way across! Whoa! Matchy, matchy. That's so nifty. And then here we've got capital G, lowercase g, lowercase h, lowercase h. Have we seen that before? Yeah. On the right. On the right? Oh, over here. So here we need some new symbol. Let's do a cross. And you're like, a cross? Is that what Jesus' genotype was? I don't know. It's an excellent question. If you would have, if if, if you would have submitted Jesus' saliva to 23andMe, would it have matched Joseph? Would he have come up as his father? Now, you ever wonder that? I wonder that all the time. Oh, man. Anyways, sorry, that's another story for another time. Lowercase g, lowercase g, capital H, lowercase h. Look at that. We got another match. We got another match. And then the last one, lowercase, 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 lowercase. That's new, too. Okay? Capital G, capital G, lowercase h, lowercase h. Is that the only place that shows up? I think so. Yeah. Okay, so we've got some unique things going on. Now, as far as our genotype ratios are concerned, there are too many different options. So let's just focus on the phenotypes. Okay, and let's assume this is seed color and this is plant height. So this right here would be green seeds that are tall. And this would be yellow seeds that are short. 
And you're like, okay, cool. So here we should be able to generate four different phenotypes. We should be able to generate the green seeds that are tall, green and tall, right? Yes? Yes. And then we should be able to do green and short. Yes? And then we should be able to do yellow and tall. And we should be able to do yellow and short. four possibilities. Yes. Okay, and so let's count them. Of these 16 offspring, how many of them are going to be green and tall? What is this one going to be? Green, green and tall. So that's one. What about this tall. one? Two. Green and tall. That's two. Green this one. Tall. Green and tall. That's three. Four. This one. Five. Green and tall. That's four. This five. one. Five. Green and tall. This five. one. No. Nope. That one's not one. This one. Six. 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 That one's not. This one is. Seven. This one is. Seven. This one's not. Not. Nine. not. Nine. Yes. So nine. Nine out of the 16 offspring oh, yeah. are going to be green and tall. Well, they're both dominant. What do you expect? What do you expect? Remember when we did a monohybrid cross, it was three to one. Yeah. You know what happens when you take three to one? Three and x1, and then you multiply it by another one that's three x1, and you foil it? Yeah. Anyways, we'll, we'll get there. Okay, so now let's do green and short. Yeah. Green and short, no, 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 those are all green and tall. This one. one's green and short, yeah. so that's one. Two. two. This one's two. Three right here. Ooh, that's Three that are green and short. What about yellow and tall? Uh, none here. We've already got all those. Uh, none here. There's one. There's two. And there's three. That's yellow and tall. Yellow and tall. And then what about yellow and short? One. Just this one. The sad one out of every 16 that got both... Characters got a recessive trait for both its copies. That's great. Okay, so the phenotypic ratios in a dihybrid cross then are what? Nine to, Nine to three. three to three to one. Wait, so that's what? A little over 50 percent. Yeah, nine out of 16 would be 50, yeah, yeah 57, 58 percent, maybe. 58 Okay. But this is so cool. Watch this. Watch this for a second. Okay? So everybody have this? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to make some room. Let's say we do a monohybrid cross twice. Because we could have just separated this and say two characters will deal with their crosses separate. Okay? So we can have individuals or we can get that are like this. Right? Or here, let's just put them. 3G to 1 lowercase g. Remember when we did our monohybrid cross? That was what we got. Right? And we can't cross these because, no, it's, it's not a 36, Kyle. It's, that doesn't look any better. It's a 3 capital G, and it's a 1 lowercase g. But we can't combine them, right? Because they're different variables. And then we're going to cross this with a, another individual that is like this. And we foil them, right? Well, actually, we would want to do this. Sorry, 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 sorry. Oh, my. Okay. And we foil them. Check this out. Yeah, we get nine Whoa. that have GH. We get, then it's outside. We get three that are G little h. Then we do inside. We get three that are little g big H. And we get one that's little h little g. That's actually so cool. Right? And it's like, so now we don't have to do this big mess. If I were going to ask you, what would be the phenotypic ratios of a trihybrid cross? You're like, I could just use algebra to figure this out. I love that so much. Because then we could just add in a third one here and maybe do this. And then you just... Well, you can't really foil now because you'd have to distribute it. Yeah, you'd have to multiply this 3i to all four of these. 
and then multiply the one i to all four of these. So it's always going to be three to one. Foil double. Yes. Yep. And this, again, this only works if we're assorting independently. If we're not assorting independently, it doesn't work. Okay? But we are. We're told it's independent assortment. It's a beautiful thing. That's not 